Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Law 2021 Online, Commercial Property Shape the Debate. My name is Mark Shelton. I'll be hosting today's event on behalf of the Solicitors Group. So in this live session, you can put your questions to Richard Snape and to myself. You can interact with us as the information is being delivered. Um, we are due to last for one hour. We'll cover your live questions and any, any pre-submitted questions. Um, so to the right hand side, you'll see there's a chat function. So all the questions are submitted in private. Um, so, you know, please, please ask away. Um, if you're watching this as a replay, then, you know, the live chat function obviously is disabled, but you can contact the solicitors group for further information on any points that you want to, uh, you want to cover. Um, there will be a recording of this session sent out by email within 48 hours. So please do keep an eye out for that. So I guess just a few words to introduce ourselves before we before we start. Uh, as I said, I'm Mark Shelton. I've worked in major commercial law firms uh, for 29 years uh, as a property litigator, and I've acted for a range of clients from uh, FTSE 100 investment companies and major corporate occupiers uh, through to small businesses and individuals. And uh, my, my field is commercial property management law, um, so as well as advising on structuring and documentation of transactions. I've um, handled a wide range of commercial property disputes, um, acting for landlords and also for tenants. I am now a non-practicing solicitor um, and I work as a commercial property management law trainer. Uh, so putting that experience to, I hope, is good use in, in training both lawyers and surveyors. Um, so as part of Law 2021 Online Commercial Property, my sessions have been um, advising occupiers on post-COVID rent debt um, and also the relaunched lease code, what's good, what's bad, and what's just unfortunate. Um, so, so that's me, Richard, uh, has been Head of Professional Support at David Jones Bold since 2002, um, formerly a Senior Lecturer in Law and Head of Land Law at the University of West of England in Bristol. And uh, he speaks at numerous courses for law societies all over the country, various public courses, in-house seminars within solicitors firms. Uh, he's also talked extensively to both local authorities and central government bodies. Um, and his areas of specialism include both commercial and residential property, in particular in relation to local government law, conveyancing issues, development land, commercial property and encumbrances in relation to land. Um, and as part of Law 2020 Online Commercial Property, Richard's sessions have been commercial leases update and termination of commercial leases by the tenant, including vacant property issues. And I think um, before we start dealing with questions, Richard would like to um, give a little update on uh, some of the matters covered in his sessions. So I'll uh, hand over to you, Richard, and invite you to do that. Yeah, the update is, to some extent, um, the same as uh, the update or similar to the update I gave if you were listening to the, the residential course uh, a week ago. Firstly, um, um, I think we, uh, uh, I think these, uh, they, we recorded these things back in the end of March. Um, they talk about it in government, but they've changed planning yet again. Uh, in England only, not Wales. Um, they've been talking about it in a white paper uh, last year, but on March the 31st, the government introduced into Parliament, the day Parliament ceased to sit for the Easter recess, they decided to introduce into Parliament uh, a new amendment regulations in relation to use classes. It's in the notes, and it was in my original talk, that last September they converted use classes A1, A2 and A3 and B, which is business use in uh, professional services, retail um, and restaurants and the likes, uh, into one huge use class, use class E. So with a few exceptions like pubs and theatres, and cinemas, not that there'll be too many left in the not too distant future, uh, you could convert your retail into, sh into restaurants or offices or vice versa. Um, as of August the 1st, the regulations, the amendment order has gone through now. As of August the 1st, you're going to be able to convert Class E, this huge business use, into uh, Class C3 dwellings. Maximum uh, gross internal floor area of 1,500 square meters. Uh, it's got to have been used for commercial, have commercial use within the last two years and be vacant for at least three months. But all these redundant shops and the likes in the uh, town and city centers in England, at least and not Wales, uh, can be converted into housing without planning permission. That's the, that's the idea. 
And then they'll find out that they can't get building regulations because of things like Grenfell. They'll find out there's nowhere to park. It's subject to prior approval from the council. The council can object on the grounds of things like traffic or the environment, flooding, this kind of thing. But uh, you've got that to look forward to, and it's quite major when it comes in. I do stress only England, not Wales. The other one uh, I mentioned last uh, week to some of you is there's a fire safety bill mentioned in the notes, which is primarily about residential properties and post Grenfell uh, buildings of more than 18 or 18 or more meters in height, six stories we roughly come within the fire safety bill. It does apply to mixed use premises as well. If it's got at least two dwellings in it, it's now the fire safety act. It was actually on the news a couple of weeks ago when it finally received the royal assent on April the 29th, not in force yet, but your fire safety risk assessments for mixed use premises, including dwellings, uh, is uh, well now requires a risk assessment for the exterior of the building, the uh, external doors and windows, uh, any internal parts uh, which uh, doors and which open into the uh, communal areas, and also the in, well and also uh, well pertages like uh, well, balconies as well was come within the risk assessments. I think a lot of fire safety risk assessments, residential and mixed use, are going to be out of date in the not too distant future. I might just ask how old the risk assessment is. Uh, one of the other things I was going to mention, or the other thing I was going to mention, I understand, is uh, one of the uh, questions we got in advance, so I'll leave that to that moment in time. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Richard. Um, of course, if there's any questions on anything that Richard's just mentioned, then do, do type them into the chat box. But um, uh, there's a question which I, which I think is addressed to me, um, which was um, to do with the sort of post-COVID emergence, um, emergence from lockdown and the, the hangover of rent debts and so forth. But it's a kind of related question, which is, um, are, are COVID break options now the market norm? Um, and I think cer certainly tenants are looking for some kind of protection in the event of uh, you know, god forbid any sort of rerun of the events we've had over the past um, past 15 months or so um I, I think landlords are resistant to the idea of linking a break option to covid or having a break option triggered by covid um i think um it is much more the case that landlords are prepared to concede rent suspension in, in, in the event of um, a pandemic, in the event of a lockdown, you know, which de facto has been the case anyway during uh, the, the uh, present crisis because of the various government restrictions on recovery of rent arrears. Um, so um, COVID rent suspension clauses, I think, certainly uh, have a lot of traction. Certainly the judge thought so in a lease renewal case that was decided at the end of March involving WH Smith and, um, and a German property investor, Commerce Real. And uh, that was a case, actually, the judge didn't have to decide because the parties have both agreed um, that there should be in the new lease granted upon renewal um, provision for rent suspension in the event that there was a forced closure of premises due to a pandemic. Um, but the judge commented on that. The judge said he thought it was something that all tenants want and something which the market has, has priced in. And he therefore didn't um, order any discount on the amount of the rent to reflect the benefit to the tenant of that, uh, that COVID rent suspension clause. Um, so I think something is going to be quite difficult for landlords to resist, at least in, in, in retail leases for sure. Um, but then again, I mean, I think that case illustrates the context is important as well, because that was a case where the tenant, who was WH Smith, um, their premises incorporated a post office. They had actually been able to trade and had kept open throughout the entire pandemic. Um, the difficulty being they sat in the middle of an enormous echoing empty shopping centre and they had about a 90% drop in footfall. So it actually cost them quite a lot to open for trade. It wasn't a benefit to them. Um, and the order there um which the judge made was for um the 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 rent suspension to be triggered if non-essential retail was ordered to close even if those premises themselves might be permitted to to remain open so so it's going to differ according to context but i think certainly a degree of um uh, uh, accommodation for tenants in the event of a further lockdown is, is certainly normal now so i hope that uh answers that question um and um uh the next question is, I think, the one that Richard was um, alluding to earlier on, which is regarding business rates and empty properties. Does the six week occupation in every three month period also apply to industrial units and warehousing or is it six weeks in every six month period? Yeah, it's um, industrial units and warehousing pay 100% business rates after six months. 
So uh, the uh, six weeks in any three month period in the normal sort of retail office sector and the likes uh, doesn't apply to industrial warehouses, uh, industrial units and warehousing, it is six uh, weeks and only six month period. The, uh, I'm not sure if I mentioned this in the, the actual uh, the, um, the webinar, but the Welsh government is certainly consulting, I've not seen anything definite on it, and making it six months in any uh, occupation in any three month or six month period before you can avoid business rates uh, in your empty properties. And the other thing which is happening, this, uh, I say this was a question that somebody sent a day or two ago. Um, the other thing which is happening uh, is that uh, there is a case mentioned in my webinar called uh, Rossendale Borough Council and Hurstwood, which was a Court of Appeal case on these uh, business rates for empty property avoidance schemes. It wasn't specifically the six weeks in any six month period or three months if it's uh, commercial, general commercial. It was about the fact that uh, companies in liquidation uh, and administration, their business premises don't pay business rates for the duration. So the other scheme besides sort of the short term, six weeks every three months uh, uh, idea to avoid business rates, the other schemes that are set up basically involve setting up an off the shelf company, a uh, uh, special purpose vehicle with no assets and then shutting it down, uh, and going into liquidation and avoiding the business rates and then not producing accounts. So it goes back to the Crown who don't pay business rates. And back in 2019, quite surprisingly, the Court of Appeals said that that was uh, a valid way of avoiding business rates, just like the six weeks in any three month period. It's being heard by the House of Lords or the Supreme Court, I'll get used to it one day, 10 years on, but it's being heard <laughs> by the Supreme Court uh, late last year, late, late October of last year. My understanding is the, they're gonna give their judgment on Friday, May the 14th. So if it affects you, watch this space, because uh, if they decide on one, they're probably going to say something about the other schemes. So they might have a very limited future life expectancy. But there's a great day in the Snape household, May the 14th. <laughs> I shall be watching with Beatty. Yeah. Well, you and, you and many others, I'm sure. Um, yeah, that's going, to be, uh, that's going to be an interesting one. Um, and... Um, uh, the, the the next question, I think, also on for you, and one that I'll be um, interested to hear what you've got to say, is uh, how significant do you think that the case of Sarah and Blacks will prove to be? Oh, it's extremely significant. It brings in some of the issues you just brought in about lease renewals already. So to recap, Sarah and Hussein and Blacks Outdoor uh, Clothing, it's Blacks the, you know, the outdoor leisure people, it was a uh, premises in the centre of Liverpool and Sarah and Hussein uh, the landlords and um, it had a very common service charge provision whereby you uh, well basically the landlord certificate would be conclusive as to the service charge liability and uh, the court of appeal unlike the first instance judge decided that that means what it says uh, it's conclusive uh, both as to the itemised statement, I've got Amazon at the front door at the moment, um, but it always happens, but uh, both as to the itemised statement and also the actual amount to be owed. And unless there was uh, manifest, um, in manifestly incorrect or unless there was uh, mathematical error or fraud, then it stood. That is a very, very common service charge provision, some variation of that. There'd been a previous case, uh, albeit a residential case, which is also mentioned in those called Finchbourne and Rodriguez from the mid 1970s, which said you can imply a reasonableness test uh, in service charges. And it's automatically implied in residential units by the 85 Landlord and Tenant Act, but uh, not for commercial anymore, Court of Appeal is given. They were seeking leave to appeal to the Supreme Court on it. Um, so it might not be the end of the day on it, but uh, it's very, very important. The dispute was about two years service charge liability because the tenant was basically arguing that various things within the, uh, uh, within the itemized statement were covered via service charge. Uh, and the court decided that doesn't matter. It's, it's not open to you to dispute it because you agreed that term. They also said that your tenant solicitors were very unwise to have agreed that term. I don't think they realize how common that term is. I've already seen it in relation, I'll come back to you now, but I've already seen it in relation to your issue on lease renewals and the rent suspension. 
mm. tenants are wanting to, somebody was asking about the other day, and tenants wanting to change that service charge provision and make it subject to a reasonableness test and the tenant's ability to question and adjudication. Yeah, well, th- th- that that is actually um, another question that we have here, um, just kind of following up on that really, which is um, on a lease renewal, should the tenant try to change the service charge provisions to deal mm. with Sarah and Black, Sarah and Black? Yeah, I know what you said about uh, W.H. Smith and, and Connor's real investment Gesellschaft. Um, I thought it was Welsh, actually, not German. Yeah. Uh, they, um, they, uh, the starting point should be Joe May and City of London Real Property in the 1980s, which was a House of Lords case, I'll get that right, uh, which said that, save in exceptional circumstances, you're not supposed to change the terms of the lease on the renewal. And to some extent, that goes for... Um, uh, bringing up to modern standards. Um, it'll be an interesting one, but I think tenants on that one, unlike the rent suspension provisions, which I can still have heard that argument on numerous occasions already, I think it's a difficult one to, to, to judge if that ever was to go to court. I, I think I agree. And I, I was trying to think about what, what tenants can do as a sort of defensive measure. Um, and the only thing I could come up with is... Um, uh, ask for um, a, if there's a disputed point on, on some element of service charge, go to court and ask for a declaration as to the correct interpretation of the service charge provision, and then on the back of that, um, potentially injunct the landlord to prevent them issuing the end of year certificate. That's, that's about all I can think of that one can do, which is a bit li- bit litigation heavy. Yeah, that's looking like a true litigator. <laughs> yeah. doing the, as of now, for new leases, is make sure that clause isn't there. I say the court did say they thought the solicitors were negligent letting that go through, and they just cannot realise how standard that is. There was the other case as well that's they're from February of this year. That's I mentioned in my course, the uh, Criterion Buildings with Kinsey mm. from uh, mm. Piccadilly Circus, uh, the Criterion uh, Restaurant and the Criterion Theatre, where they'd had six years of dispute over service charge, and the, the landlords, the, the service charge provision there said that the tenant pays a due proportion and that's um, decided by the landlords or the landlords surveyors to be a fair proportion and the tenant was in dispute over uh, the land thinking that the landlord was putting too much towards the reserve fund and also the lifts had been replaced when the tenant was arguing they didn't need to be replaced at huge expense and the court said the same thing basically high court case that you agreed that you agreed that the landlord surveyors can tell you what a fair proportion is and you're stuck with it yeah uh, big, big change. Absolutely, yeah. Um, okay, I mean, actually, just, just um, to, to just one thing that just occurred to me as well while you're speaking is, is of course, the service charge code um, says that tenants should have an opportunity to challenge the certificate. So, uh, and that's now part of the RICS professional conduct framework. Mm-hmm. So, one would expect. Also, the service charge code goes out its way to saying that on, on a renewal, the renewal lease should comply with the code. So it'll be interesting to see what yeah. surveyors negotiate. Actually. It'll be interesting to see to what yeah. extent surveyors sort of follow that. Yeah. Um, but as a matter of, as you know, a matter of law, if it's unambiguous, then it doesn't matter. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Um, if we just just rewind briefly to the um, uh, business rates and empty properties, there's a follow-up question here. Uh, I'm not sure I totally understand the question. You may better. Um, it says, what happens to the lease in that context? What, sorry, what happens to the lease in that context, i.e. business rates and empty properties? In terms of? Uh, th- that, that's the question that I have. Well, the short-term lease. Sorry? Short, the short-term lease. Um, the question well, is, what, what happens to the lease? I think, <coughs> I, I think it's this. If not, let me know. Hmm. Uh, that, as I mentioned, that uh, one way of avoiding business rates, uh, which the courts have accepted, uh, is by creating a sort of six-week uh, lease or license. It doesn't really matter if it's for six months or less in duration, because it won't come within the 54 Act anyway. Uh, and you create a six-week lease, or let's call it a lease, uh, for just for six weeks, then the occupier leaves waits three months and then another six weeks or six months if it's an industrial unit, and then another six week lease or license. Uh, it's why we get so many things among others like you know, sort of the gift shop in the run up to Christmas, the pop up shops of this world, not paying any rental, they're just avoiding business rates. Um, and you know, things like I think, vaping shops and this kind of thing as well, I've seen used as this as a way of avoiding business rates. But there were several. Um, cases, um, high court cases, which have basically said 
that uh, uh, even if it's to some extent looks like a sham device, you're still occupying for business purposes, just a few boxes in this otherwise unoccupied premises. We'll have to see what happens on Friday with the Supreme Court on that one. But you know, it doesn't have any degree of security. It just comes to the end at the end of six weeks. Sorry, so there's a little uh, clarification there to saying in, in the context of winding up. So um, oh, yeah. I guess this is b b perhaps a, um, uh, sort of directed a, a, a disclaimer of the lease, I imagine. <coughs> oh, yeah, I mean, they're just, you, they're, yeah, it's, uh, you wind up the, the premises. I mean, basically, it goes eventually back to the Crown under Bona Vacantia. Uh, and uh, it's disclaimed, and the Crown doesn't pay business rates. And you've also cut down on your liquidation costs by doing that. But again, we'll have to see what happens as of May the 14th, because that's the direct issue in relation to this new case. Yeah. Green Court. Okay. All right. I think we better move on. Um, and the next question is to do with the lifting of um, restrictions on recovery of rent. Uh, and, the, and the question is referring to a couple of recent cases. It says, don't the TFS stores and Bank of New York cases mean that the lifting of restrictions is a bit of a non-event e non because landlords have effective remedies anyway? Um, so, I mean, those two cases... Um, yeah, good news for landlords where um, the courts have dealt with some of the potential defences that people are always likely to raise to, to, for, for, um, to, to rental claims um, over the course of the pandemic where premises have been closed and so forth. Um, and they found in the favour of the landlord. And I think what those cases show um, is that landlords were not without remedies during the pandemic. They always had some remedies. I mean, for example, stat demands uh, restricted in relation to corporate tenants, but not in relation to individual tenants. It was always possible to serve a stat demand on an individual tenant. Um, forfeit year has been permitted throughout the pandemic in relation to non-rent breaches, which may be a kind of a sort of side door at getting at rent breaches and, and, and putting a bit of pressure on tenants. Um, but also, you know, there was never any restriction on simply suing to recover arrears, as has been done in these the, the, these two cases. Um, and actually, you know, if you get a judgment, actually enforcing a judgment, you've got social distancing requirements applying to sheriffs and enforcement agents, well, it has potentially some difficulties. But, um, you know, taking control of goods isn't the only method of enforcing a judgment. You've got other options. You've got um, charging orders over properties. You've got third, um, you know, third party debt orders. Still useful to, 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 to have a judgment. Now, um, so what we have seen over the course of the pandemic because of course the courts have built up a big backlog of cases and it's taken them a while to deal with them so cases like this are just now um getting a hearing and there may well be quite a few more in the pipeline we'll see um or it may be that the outcome of these cases is going to persuade tenants to pay or at least to agree some settlement terms because a number of their potential defenses will have been disposed of by um, by these cases defenses like arguments that the lease has been frustrated for example um None of which makes the lifting of restrictions a non-event because, of course, you know, landlords, uh, you, we still have uncertainty as to um, how these remedies are going to come back, to what extent they'll be lifted. But if you've got the remedy of forfeiture, if you've got the remedy of CRA, commercial rent arrears recovery, they're quicker, they're cheaper, they're often more effective than, than, than going to court. Um, and, you know, if, if one has gone down the court route in the meantime and has a judgment, well, of course, it puts the landlord's entitlement beyond question, and that can help in using the, those two remedies as well. So, um, uh, so, so no, not a, not a non-event, but I mean, they're, they're certainly significant cases, and uh, we can probably expect to see some more along those lines as we, um, as we, as we go forward. I think um, whatever happens, because the government's still consulting on forfeiture for non-payment for rent, uh, you've got to also think to yourself about what I was talking about previously. You know, you don't affect forfeiture unless you've got somebody else lined up because you might just be paying full business rates after three or six months of empty property, not just rental liability. And in some parts of the country, that is enormous. Yeah. That's an issue. Yeah. Oh, and the, the, there's you know, the, the whole range of things you've got to think about whether you decide whether to forfeit. But yeah, I mean, um, top of the list is going to be um, the, the ability to relet. Uh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I'm, I'm, I've come across. I remember coming across it in the days of the credit crunch all those years ago, mm. where tenants had just upped and left and done a run and never to be seen again. But you'd rather you know, just shore up the premises, you know, sort of to cut off the services and the likes, and and can keep the premises empty uh, because you can argue to the rating authority that uh, you know, go and pursue the tenant for the business rates, not us. Sure, absolutely. You'll have absolutely. a lot of that as well. Uh, I mean, it's a similar kind of vein. There's another question, which is, um, is there any indication yet 
uh, of how the government intends to phase out restrictions on rent recovery from from 30th of June. Um, to which the short answer really is no. Um, you know, we've had the, the consultation document um, setting out a range of options. Number one being just simply taking all the restrictions off at a stroke, the, you know, the famous cliff edge, um, which seems pretty unlikely, um, through to at the sort of other end of the spectrum, uh, imposing some form of mandatory and binding adjudication process, um, which I suspect is probably also slightly unlikely, but various um, responses to the consultation have um, been published. So the BPF have published their consultation response. Uh, Property Litigation Association have theirs. Doubtless there are going to be many other people who responded, law firms, landlords, occupiers. Um, <clears throat> the consultation closed about a week ago. Um, so obviously government's got to digest that and um, take some decisions. Uh, they've got to take some decisions fairly quickly because 30th June will be upon us quite quickly. Um, so hopefully quite soon we'll see what they what they intend to do. I mean, I, I rather like um, the the BPF um, idea of the sort of principle that you ring fence, as it were, all the arrears which fell due during the pandemic period and any restrictions which may continue to apply to recovery of arrears apply only to those arrears. But for rent falling due after restrictions have lifted, then there should be no restriction. That, that, that seems to me to be sort of logical and fair. Um, but, you know, that's only my view and um, we'll see what government comes out with. Uh, so yeah, watch this. Uh, watch this space. I think is the answer to that. Uh, Mark, are you finding? Mm. Are you coming across any tenants who could easily afford the rent but deliberately not paying it on time? Oh, I mean, um, not not personally, as I'm still non practicing, of course, anymore. But no, but I mean, anecdotally, yeah, lots and lots of examples of that. Lots of stories of that. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so um, and, and I suspect you know that, that that's going to part of the value to landlords of those two cases, the TFS stores case and, and the Bank of New York case, in, in that um, um, those tenants know that um, when the restrictions are lifted, they are going to have to pay. And so they will pay, presumably right at the last moment, yeah. um, but they will pay. So, uh, but, but yeah, it, it's um, it's not been a very attractive feature of um, the past the past 15 months, really. That. Yeah. Um, Richard, one for you. Um, will keep open clauses ever be enforceable? <laughs> did, you, did you cover keep open clauses at all, Mark? Um, I mentioned them in the lease code uh, yeah. session, yeah. Yeah, because there was, a, as I mentioned in my talk, there's, there was a series of you know, sort of the cases on keep open clauses. Uh, the sort of you must keep your premises open at normal business hours, often in the retail sector. They were much litigated in the mid 90s, including a case called Cooperative Insurance in Argyle, which was all about a uh, mini supermarket in Sheffield, Argyle, used to own Safeways before uh, Sains, uh, before Morrison's took them over. And they shut down their shop in breach of a keep open clause. They were making huge losses because uh, the out of town shopping centre Meadow Hall opened on the M1, or well, not on, off the M1, I would hope, uh, a, you know, a few years previously, and uh, went all the way to the Supreme Court arguing you've got to keep your shop open and the Supreme Court said you'll never be required to keep premises open. It's not enforceable by injunction or specific performance. But there are other remedies available. I, the reason I was mentioning it in, the, um, uh, in my webinar is because, well, A, of its topicality at the moment. If you've had to shut your shop because of you know, lockdown restrictions, then you're not in breach of a keep open clause if it's a statutory requirement. But lots of people haven't reopened when they could have reopened the likes. And there's a lot of breach of the keep open clauses. Uh, you could affect forfeiture, but save in exceptional circumstances like the SHB and Cribs Causeway case I mentioned, you're not going to want to affect forfeiture because it's probably what the tenant wants in life. You know, it's the best break clause you never had to negotiate. Um, but uh, you can sue in damages um, for your loss. If the tenant's continuing to pay the rent until they can find somebody to assign or sublet to, you, you know, what's your loss? Uh, and... Uh, well, I'd leave this to the value to tell me, but if you're the anchor tenant like uh, Morrison's in that little supermarket arcade, then you're probably not attracting other tenants or having to reduce the rentals. Uh, and so there might be a loss. Um, and so I'd leave it to the value to tell you. But people are negotiating on agreeing those keep open clauses when you're talking about the little news agents at the end. I suspect they're not enforceable by even damages. 
Yeah, I think I, I, I'd, I'd agree with that. I mean, they, they don't seem to have much of a benefit to anybody, um, keep open clause, except, of course, in Scotland. Um, they're enforceable, yeah. Where they're enforceable by specific performance, uh, oddly enough. Um, but, but um, I mean, it, 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 it's interesting, actually, that um, uh, if you look at the... Um, uh, the, the the BPS small business retail lease, you know, standard lease which they produce, they, it doesn't have a keep open covenant in it, um, and and I think landlords will quite happily do without. I mean, I, I ask people in, in in training sessions, you know, do you think landlords yeah. will do without keep open covenants, and and people largely say yes. Um, There's always exceptions, though. I mean, it's like the conditions precedent on break clauses. It, yeah, of course, the landlord, and it's going to be a tenant's market for the next most a large number of areas in the next year or two. I think you could resist the keep open clause. Yeah. I think the other the other situation where they might even in the high street be of value, if you're the sort of shop uh, running off the high street, you know, into the arcade and you're the one on the high street, if you shut down, it puts people off going to the whole of the arcade so they could be enforceable in damages. Mm -hmm. But again, I'd leave that to the valuers to tell me. Yeah. I mean, of course, if... if um uh, if, if, if rents payable on a turnover basis, as is increasingly the case with retail mm -hmm. leases, then you've got a more than usual interest in the tenants staying open for trade. But I mean, there's other protections in turnover rent leases to deal with that, yeah. you know, with, with a kind of notional nominal turnover and so forth. Yeah. Um, so, um, okay. Um, and um, uh, this one I think is, is for me, something I mentioned in my talk about post-COVID rent debt. Um, how would the Law Commission's proposed reforms to forfeit your law help? Um, well, uh, in law commission's proposed reforms to forfeiture law, um, well, that proposal was made in 1994, first of all, so that's been outstanding for a while. Um, I mean, there was actually an, an indication back in 2017 that government were looking at enacting that. Um, I, I think now, with this kind of post-COVID rent debt, it would be a brilliant time to do it, uh, and it's uh, off the peg or oven ready, whichever phrase you prefer, you know, way of dealing with some of the problems. Um, and the answer is how, how would they help um, really by doing away with some of the harsher aspects of the current law but also bringing more flexibility into into matters um, so for start off you'd lose forfeiture by peaceable re-entry um, where you know tenants obviously <clears throat> particularly with arrears of rent they just turn up in the morning and find the locks have been changed and that's an end of it so so that's very harsh and very archaic really so that would be done away with um, you know from a landlord's point of, point of view there'd be a benefit because um, you know, the, the doctrine of waiver of the right to forfeit is tremendously inconvenient and that would be done away with by the Law Commission's reforms. Um, but I think more importantly, rather than uh, the current sort of options open to a court of either granting possession or granting relief from forfeit yet effectively, um, the court would have a totally unrestricted range of orders. The, the, the Law Commission's scheme suggests a number of different types of orders. So you can have a, a termination order, bringing the lease to an end, um, a remedial order requiring the tenant to put right whatever it's done or not done by, by a certain date, an order for sale requiring the lease to be sold, proceeds to be distributed in a specified order, um, wide range of options and all that would make it um you know much more easy to 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 do justice to the parties really and the court could put it, uh, conditions upon the grant of any order like payment of sums owed provision of security for future performance that kind of thing um so i think it'd be really helpful um but i'm not holding my breath because you know it has been 27 years since those proposals were first put forward um anyway uh hope that answers that one um the the Next one I see um, is actually just kind of rewinding a little bit to something you just mentioned, Richard, which is um, uh, in break clauses, what conditions precedent are acceptable to tenants? Well, if I'm a tenant, none of them. Uh, <laughs> the answer. Um, again, it depends on the market. Uh, I've still seen, and it amazes me, break clauses with an absolute condition precedent. You must comply with the terms of the lease. And I've seen those not on some 25 year old lease, you know, sort of, I've seen those in modern leases and you just could not let that go through. But you still see, it's a bit, as we mentioned, it's a bit like uh, as we mentioned previously, it's one if you push the landlord, especially in the tenant's market, that's gonna come for a large number of areas. Um, you can get rid of the material compliance, reasonable compliance, substantial compliance. It's almost asking for litigation as well. And breaks are gonna be so, so common as, as tenants downsize and the likes want better deals and the likes this next couple of years, two or three years. Um, I think if it was a compromise between the landlord and tenant, I, I genuinely think, you, you would think this if you act for tenants, but 
I, I genuinely think there's nothing wrong with just having a clear break and you can always sue the tenant for antecedent breaches in any way. And you get this argument, well, what if the tenant's not worth suing? Uh, well, why do you want to keep him as your tenant, subject to perhaps what we just talked about in business rates and the rights? Um, I, I used to be amazed <coughs> in my sort of biography that, uh, in my introduction, that uh, I, used to, I still do quite a bit, but I used to do quite a lot with people like Defence Estates and NHS and the likes when they were tenants. And I used to be amazed that, you know, just let them break the lease. They're worth suing. But uh, let them break the lease. I used to be amazed that they people on solicitors acting for the landlords wanted the Ministry of Defence to find guarantors. But they go like a business. You know, we're all in trouble. <laughs> I think the compromise is what, uh, I don't know, you presume you mentioned it, the code. Uh, leasing business premises says the basic rent is up to date, not service charge or insurance reserved as rent, but the basic rent. Uh, the tenant gives up occupation. And any subsisting subleases come to an end. I think that's the compromise. And yep. that's what you get normally. Yeah, I think that's right. And, and I think, um, uh, you know, the, the, I think there's a case for saying, well, if you're going to give the tenant a valuable property right, the right to break the lease early, then at least you should expect to get the property back in a decent state of repair. Shouldn't have to spend money or t take time before you, before you can relet. Um, but I mean, you know, that, well, it, it, it it's arguable, and, and I think, as you say, if you qualify that by reference to material or substantial compliance, it's a help. Um, but that's not what the lease code says. The lease code, the lease code says specifically, goes out of its way to say there should be no conditionality upon performance of tenants' covenants. Mm -hmm. um, so, so there it is. Yeah. yeah. And uh, in terms of giving up vacant, it does actually say giving up occupation, doesn't it? Not that's right. Vacancy, but, yeah. Uh, yeah. Which are not quite the same thing, but I'd be careful if that's a strange case from last November. I mentioned that uh, Capital and Global case, mm -hmm. where they didn't give up vacant possession, not by leaving things behind, but by taking things with them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's a very strange case, and dependent to some extent on its facts. It's also a good message that uh, the surveyors have to meet well in advance and discuss their differences. Because they are uh, a bit more detailed in the notes, they, in the course of uh, delivering up this old premises, they found that the boiler didn't work and didn't want to spend huge amounts of money replacing the boiler, which would be replaced by an incoming tenant anyway, by a brand new one. And so they left it too late to do the rest of the works and just took everything with them and didn't give up vacant possession, according to that judge. And it's a thin line between what you can take and what you shouldn't take, you know? Yeah. I, th I think I've heard that's going to appeal have you, have you heard that or? going to appeal yeah it's yeah going, yeah, yeah. I, I wouldn't be surprised if that gets overturned but, but and that's rather boring speculation isn't it but I mean, they, did, you know, they yeah. did leave the premises it's just a shell if you like yeah yeah uh they took you know yeah i've seen stranger things happening with residential conveyancing but they took the lighting with them and, and the ceiling tiles and the likes sure but uh yeah oh um <clears throat> so uh one for me, and I think quite a short one, um, referring to something I, um, uh, I'd raised in one of my sessions, is disclaimer of a lease in a solvent winding up really a risk for landlords? Um, so quite a short one. I mean, it, it, it's happened in, in a reported case, which is the reason for mentioning it, uh, the Park Air case, going back a few years now. But, um, uh, you know, it, it's not something that happens every day. Um, uh, it, I think it's something for landlords to bear in mind. I think I said in my session, the conditions for it to be something that's worthwhile a tenant doing um, are not going to crop up all that often. You, you need a tenant who is only a tenant of one premises. Um, the directors and shareholders have to be happy for the company to go into a liquidation, albeit a solvent liquidation. There's got to be funds to pay compensation to the landlord. Um, and you don't want there to be any guarantees because they won't be released by a disclaimer. So if you meet all of those all of those conditions, um, then it's a way for a tenant to get out of the lease. It's almost a sort of um, uh, put option, paying you know, paying the landlord a um, reverse premium. Um, and um, it, it's it's something that does happen, but it's not going to happen an awful lot of the time. I mean, if, if landlords are worried about it on letting to a single site tenant, then taking a guarantee is a useful sort of discouragement. Um, 
the longer the term, the greater the compensation payable. So, you know, if one man manages to negotiate for a longer term, which of course isn't so easy in the current market, then that also can be a discouragement. But um, uh, I think, you know, it, it, it's something to bear in mind, but it's not something one should lose an, an enormous amount of sleep over, but it, it's a theoretical possibility, really. Anything you've ever come across, Richard? Don't... Not really. I mean, no. 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 Not really. Okay. okay. Um, so, um, moving on, one for one for you, Richard. Um, how do you think that the recent changes to planning law will affect user and alienation covenants? Yeah, bear, bear in mind since we first recorded these things in, in March, and so it surprised me that uh, it's changing once again, and this is England only and uh, not Wales. Wales were consulting on changes to planning uses and uh, permitted development back in 2018, but I've not heard anything since. Um, I think it's enormously significant because, again, you know, with the exceptions of pubs and cinemas and the likes, which is sui generis, you need planning permission. We've just got, so there are transitional provisions until July, or the end of July, but we've just got this now big use class E, uh, you know, sort of general business use, uh, which then will be interchangeable with MA, which is coming along C3 dwellings. Um, if landlords don't like that, so it doesn't satisfy them in terms of rental, they change the user covenants in the lease, and that's something you really need to think about uh, very, very carefully as of now. Again, you've got that obvious problem that we've been talking about with all the existing leases and what happens on lease renewals. Um, but uh, you know, if you don't want that premises to be a dwelling or if you don't want that premises to be shop or a, whatever, a restaurant, then you make clear in the lease, probably subject to a user covenant not to you know, change use without consent, not to be unreasonably withheld. Uh, but that uh, secret nominees case, that Supreme Court case uh, from uh, late or towards the end of 2019, seems like a lifetime ago, dealt with user covenants and also alienation covenants as well, and basically said the landlord can take their own interests into account unless the tenant's interests far outweigh the landlord's. So even if the user covenants are subject to a reasonableness test, if the landlord can prove that they're going to suffer financial loss as a consequence, they can probably refuse consent. It also knocks on, has knock-on implications of other things, because the sequent nominees case was also about not so much, there wasn't a need to change use, they had a user covenant that allowed both residential and commercial use. But it was about the fact that uh, you, if you were going to, uh, obtain planning permission, you wouldn't uh, make a planning application without the landlord's consent not to be unreasonably withheld. And suddenly, now, since September in England, and even more so in August, there's huge numbers of situations where you won't need planning permission to change use. So you need to think about changing that. And again, we've got all the problems of you know, sort of things that are already up and running. We've got the problems on lease renewals we've been talking about before. <laughs> and the other thing is, uh, if you are doing this, then stop is just you know, leases tend to refer to the use classes which are allowed, you know, class A, one, two, and three. Well, that's just now out of date, you know. Mm -hmm. I think you've got to refer to the actual specific user rather than just the general use class, because who knows what the government got planned, uh, you know, in the future. It's interesting, interesting, really, because the use, the changes to the use classes order mean that um, control over the use of space in town centres and everywhere, really passes from local authority to landlords. Um, <coughs> and if landlords don't maintain control through leases, then who's in control? You know, nobody. Yeah, um, you could say the same about freehold restrictive covenants as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You're going to have to think carefully about what you want to restrict on that land. Yeah. And I, I don't think, you know, because it's sort of, it's in that domain of planning law, mm. on occasion the, the property lawyers don't give it the credit it deserves. It's got a knock-on effect on all uh, alienation covenants because the two go hand in hand. You assign and the assignee wants to change use. Yeah? And alteration covenants as well. And the sequent nominees case said in all those situations, although it was about uh, obtaining planning, uh, uh, a consent for a planning application, they said that uh, it applies to user covenants, it applies to alienation covenants and alteration covenants. Mm. There's a massive, massive change. Yeah. Yeah, I think I, I think that case, secret nominees and, and Hayford, is, is is really going to um, uh, haunt us for years to come. Actually, in all, all, all kinds of contexts. It's the Supreme Court case, and it mm. was three to two majority. I can't remember if I said that in the webinar. Mm. And I, I, you've got to accept it's correct, mm. but I cannot see how it was correct. No.
because, not least of which, because as one of the dissenting judges said, the, this was a 100-year lease with 70 years remaining on it in, in Soho in London. And uh, when you entered into that lease 30 years previously, you know, you'd have employed valuers and the like to set the rental, and the rental will be on, set on the basis that you've got this high, you know, this uh, relaxed user covenant you can use for business and residential use. Mm. And then up by the back door, uh, you can stop that residential use, not by the user covenants, which you know you paid good money for, uh, but by the consent to planning uh, applications covenant. Yeah, I, it's, it's going to make it much more difficult to advise on whether a landlord is being reasonable or not in all kinds of contexts. Mm -hmm. um, but um, um, okay, so um, uh, moving on, one one for me, um, and this is uh, coming back to what I was saying about the lease code. This one it says, could could you expand? Well, you might as well walk around and have a cup of tea then, Richard. Uh, so could you expand on your concern about apportionment of rent on lease expiry? Um, it's um, it's an odd one. This, I mean, really, the the, the lease code um, has this new provision, which I think is a very good one. Um, that what leases should say is is that when uh, a break has the effect of terminating a lease mid quarter, I mean, really on any day other than the last day of a quarter, um, that there should be a provision for the landlord to refund to the tenant any overpayment of rent, um, and um, yeah, th th that's something which. Um, the courts have struggled with a little bit. You know, the, the courts won't imply a term. That's clear from the Marks and Spencer and BNP Paribas case. Um, and um, it, it's also clear from other cases that so where you have your usual wording in the in, in the redendum, you know, the annual rent is so much per annum or a proportionate part in relation to any period of less than a year. That doesn't help you. That doesn't allow you to apportion the rent. So you need some specific apportionment provision, um, which sadly, you know, lots of solicitors miss or, or you know aren't able to negotiate with the landlord and you'll see break clauses without any, any apportionment um the worst kind of example being where um you know what looks like sort of neat drafting um you have a break clause which to, which operates the break on a quarter day um which means that the tenant has to pay an entire quarter's rent for only one day's possession if there's no specific apportionment provision um so it's a good new provision it, in the code, my point really was that um, it is surprisingly difficult um, to establish apportionment of rent in lots of other common situations. I mean, e even in the sort of classic case of lease expiry, the lease expires mid quarter. Um, can the tenant pay an apportioned amount on the quarter day immediately prior to the, the expiry date? Well, of course, in practice, they will. Um, and most of the time, landlords will accept that. Um, <clears throat> but you do get examples. I've had examples of landlords uh, trying to insist upon payment of a full quarter, um, and it's surprisingly hard to find some authority that says that, that says they're not entitled to it, um, or, you know, or, or there should be an apportionment. In, in the BNP Paribas case, um, the, the Court of Appeal justified saying that there would be an apportionment in those circumstances by reference to a case called York and Casey. Um, and if you go and look up York and Casey, um, that's a very peripheral point in the case, which is really all to do with the validity of a, a short, short old tenancy notice. Um, so it, it, it's actually quite difficult. Uh, and um, it's, it's rather odd when you think of, you know, whatever it is, 900 years of leasehold law. Um, we haven't managed to establish a kind of principle that landlords aren't entitled to be paid for a period for which they don't give possession. Um, but it would have been nice to have seen a kind of rather wider provision, in my view, in, in the lease code dealing with lease expiry, um, or potentially with um, o o other modes of termination, like under the Landlord and Tenant Act 1954, for example. Um, so th that, that that was my concern, but um, I don't think anybody else shares my concern. So probably probably nothing's going to happen about it. <laughs> I, I think it should be a matter. Of, this is a sort of you know, it should be a matter of drafting. Mm. I mean, I know the the Marks and Spencer's BNP case was uh, was it a 2008 lease. Uh, 2007, and uh, it had only come and accepted, you know, as a principle. You know, you've got that Ellington Row Bottom case from 1908 that said that, you know, if your rent's payable in advance, then you have to pay the whole amount in advance unless you say otherwise. But the, most of the cases in the past have been about forfeiture and, you know, rent arrears and this kind of stuff. And what had been suggested as of about 2008, you would apply to break clauses. Otherwise, I suspect uh, Marks and Spencers would have included something in the lease. 
I came across one, I'm not sure if I mentioned this in the, my webinar or not, it's a little anecdote, certainly wasn't in the notes. I came across one where the rent was payable yearly in advance and the rent day, uh, there was no apportionment provision, the rent day was one day before the break day. <laughs> with the consequence that uh, for one day's occupation, they paid £188,000. Good luck. I think that landlord did that deliberately, and he's probably done it before. Mm. Mm. This, the firm is solicitor, so it, you know, it was a stress. It was nothing to do with DJB or anything like that. We weren't involved in it. Yeah. But the firm were successfully sued for missing that. I'm not surprised. <laughs> so I, yeah. I suspect it's happened before then. Yeah. yeah. Well, well. Um, Okay, now this may be the last question, I think. We'll see how it goes. Um, and, it, and it's one for you, uh, Richard, which is, um, well, this, this might be quite short because I think you've really touched on this already. Uh, how can Riverside Park and NHS and Capital and Global be reconciled? Well, I can see uh, about Capital and Global. It is a strange case. And I say the one thing about it is that, uh, say a bit more detail, they didn't, they left themselves precious little time to get all the work done on this premises and they should have when they were negotiating with the landlords uh, surveyors as to what of you know what to do with this um this boiler um you know do we they should have just agreed to sort of stop or you know to stop the, the notice period for that time period but they didn't agree anything in writing uh which is a big big mistake and i say it is a come on, so many times where you know solicitors so a break notice is six month breaks or something. Uh, and the surveyor is given precious little time, you know, to actually serve the notices in the first place. Um, but uh, Riverside Park, uh, I think is more the established thing. And, you know, it's again, vacant possession, the NHS. And it was primarily about demountable partitions that large numbers of tenants place in the premises, you know, either with, with consent to alteration or not, as the case may be. And uh, it's, I say it's more the sort of norm. What are these partitions? Are they fixtures, fittings, or are they tenants' fixtures? Because if they're fixtures, they stay with the land. If they're fittings or tenants' fixtures, they go with the tenant. And uh, well, the tenant left them behind and they were held to be fittings. And if not, they would have been tenants' fixtures. I think there's a bigger question as to sort of what amounts to vacant possession, uh, quite honestly. So I think they can be reconciled and we'll have to see the future of capital and global. I think it might just be a flash in the pan. Uh, but uh, the bigger question, I get so many questions, is what actually is vacant possession? Mm -hmm. um, I was asked this in the, in the uh, course the video conference I was doing yesterday, primarily for surveyors, actually, you know, what if they leave a bag of rubbish behind and like, well, try and vacate. Uh, I think the case is a case called Cumberland Consolidated, an island sort of like, uh, just after the Second World War, 1940s case, that basically said it's got to be sufficient to not give up vacant possession to impede, substantially impede the landlord in possessing part of the premises themselves. Uh, a substantial part of the premises, which doesn't really take us anywhere. Yeah. But, uh, a bit of a dream, that is, really. Yeah. Well, there's the NYK and Ibrand case yeah. um, about 10 years ago now where um, uh, the, the, the tenant tried to rely upon that Cumberland Consolidated case. Mm. Um, and they, they, had, they had, I think they had some contractors finishing off a little bit of dilapsed work yeah, for two or three days perfect. and security, yeah. security yeah. guards. Yeah. Um, and they said, well, it doesn't substantially interfere with your use of the premises. Because if you'd come along and said, what the hell are you doing here? We'd have walked out and you'd have had possession back within 15 yeah. minutes. Um, and, and the Court of Appeal said, well, you're kind of missing a trick there. It's not just does it substantially interfere with yeah. um, the landlord's possession, but that also has to be no people there. You know, you can't stand in the middle of the warehouse and say we've gone. You know, you've got to, yeah. you've got, you've got to actually be gone. Uh, but yeah, it's an interesting. It would have been much better off getting done for a bit of dilapidations. And Exactly. He's on the last day. Exactly. And Morant and Fusion Electronics was another one, which I sort of mentioned yeah. in the court. The, um, I'll tell you, I've got time to mention this. Uh, the strangest I'd come across was early last year, just before the lockdown. It was residential, it wasn't commercial. The strangest thing they left behind was the the grandmother uh, <laughs> in a wheelchair in a <laughs> toilet underneath the stairs. They didn't have to beat that one, Mark. Uh, they didn't have enough room for the granny in her wheelchair and all their belongings in the car. And so they left her behind. Why in a toilet? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> not realizing that the purchaser would turn up with the keys and the removal van would turn up and move in. And it was about 20 minutes before this father's grandmother in the, in the toilet. So it was all settled amicably. They didn't go to the Court of Appeal on that one. But anyway. 
Well, that's that's almost an appropriate note to end on. But I, I think we'll we'll we'll, we'll 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 just squeeze in one more because this is also a very short answer, and this is this is one of my this is a question for me finally. Um, is it, you suggested I, I did uh, that government might legislate against up but only rent review. Um, is that on the cards? I've not heard of it as being under discussion. I would say that's, that's a bit of speculation on my part. My part, but I mean, it's not impossible. You know, despite the protestations of the property industry, Ireland introduced legislation against up and only rent review back in the 1990s. Um, it could well be popular with small businesses, and who you knows? Could even encourage businesses to commit to properties for longer terms rather than taking something less than five years so as to avoid an adverse rent review. Um, so I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't really tell, but I would say it's speculation on my part. I've not really heard of it. Um, being 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 discussed as such but the government's reviewing commercial landlord and tenant law generally they say so we shall see uh, it could be the kind of thing they think about with keep open covenants and who else who else knows what right well that is um all we've got time for unfortunately today um so thank you very much for attending law 2021 online commercial property shape the debate uh hosted by me mark shelton on behalf of the solicitors group thank you very much uh to richard and um uh, I've enjoyed the event. Uh, looks as if Richard has as well, so um, I hope so. Um, don't, don't forget to join the Solicitors Group Law 2021 online community on LinkedIn um, so you can continue the debate after this session, be included in exclusive offers for, for future events. Um, just a reminder that a recording of this Q&A will be sent out by email within uh, 48 hours. There's still time to watch the pre-recorded content if you haven't yet. Um, your expiry date will be displayed next to the uh, the webinar. Feedback forms uh, will be sent out when the event closes, and if you complete those, then you get, of course, you get your CPD certificate. There's an online exhibition as well at solicitorsgroup.co.uk, um, which, if you attend, enables you to access a free one-hour CPD webinar uh, from Solicitors Group's catalogue, and that's worth £35 plus VAT. So um, that's that's well worth having. And um, thank you again very much, and uh, hope everybody enjoys the rest of their day. Thanks. Thanks, Mark.